disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. History is not where we have been. It is where we are going to end up. And how will the future humans see us when they sift through the data points of the past? As thoughtful stewards of a world built by generations of mankind over ages of effort, ingenuity and reason, as giants of the past, brave men and women who gave their all for a brighter, stronger world of peace and prosperity? Or will they see us as careless looters who kept their heads in the sand as troubles loomed and spent not just their own, but the wealth of future generations, indebting them to impossible poverty while reaping only the most trivial rewards in exchange. The path is possibly set inexorably in one of these directions. Unless we, as an era of mankind, can come up with a few paradigm-shifting discoveries in science that make all our past discretions a thing of future insignificance. And perhaps that very discovery is about to be unveiled here on... This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. Kirsten? Maybe for you. That means I've been up all night. Oh, man. It is, it's time to go to bed. Jeez. Good morning. Good evening, wherever you are, people of the earth. This is This Week in Science. Thanks for joining us. Justin! I'm excited. Hey! hey. What's good... that? What's going on? What's going on? I got, I got all sorts of science and stuff like that. I just keep thinking maybe maybe I can do more 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 reading of the science stories. There's so many stories out there. How can I tell everybody about everything? There's just not enough time. Once again, I've picked all my stories by their headlines, hoping that the story uh, behind the headlines is as interesting. Yeah, that's kind of about the the way. Sometimes when I'm looking for a good book, I go into a bookstore and hope the cover is indicative of the content of the book. Yeah, it's I'm, off, put I'm often cover. very disappointed, though. Oh, <laughs> often very disappointed. <sighs> Terrible good book. Great cover artist, though. Great I cover. I recommend That's... that cover art. Yeah, absolutely. Or any other terrible book. Well, hopefully, the cover art in your case is just as good as the content of the stories. I brought. I've so got some good stuff. What do you got? I've got stories about evolution our place in the universe, and what it means to be human. What do you have? It means to be human. I have yeah. inspecting the introspective. Hmm. Is that the same story, what it means to be human and inspecting the introspective? I hope we didn't cross. I don't think, I don't think we're cross, crossing the, the streams. I've, uh, I've got the discovery of the Fountain of Youth. That most people might end up passing on. Uh, I have something else I forget. <laughs> and to have to, a way to save a bundle uh, next time you're shopping for a CEO. Oh, right. I go CEO shopping all the time. So that's really going to help. It could save you <laughs> multi millions of dollars, Kirsten. Save me a lot. <laughs> a lot of people give you those shopping tips. So they'll save you $10, $20, maybe a grand on a big purchase. This is going to save like $20 million for the <laughs> CEO buyer. <laughs> awesome. All right. So next time I need to save a billion dollars, I'll just you know keep these, these tips in mind. In the meantime, I'm going to dive right into evolution. Off the top, there's a story that was sent in by Gord McLeod uh, from Wired Science, how mass migration might have evolved. This story was written up by Brandon Keim. He writes some great, great uh, stuff for Wired Science, and I, you know, I, he's a great science writer. Highly recommend his work. Anyway, uh, this study was published September 14th in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, 
The researchers involved in the study, two Princeton evolutionary biologists, uh, made a computer model with a little digital animals in their model. This animal is going to be like this, and this animal is going to be like that. They gave them different rules to live by. Some of them were more... Um, more sensitive to social cues. Others were more so more sensitive to, um, like, uh, environmental cues, so like temperature uh, or magnetic or solar cues. Um, and what they wanted to figure out was how migration might have evolved, how it might have come to pass that animals would start migrating. You look at migrating animals now and you find that n not all the animals in a group that migrate, migrate. So sometimes there are a few stragglers that just don't leave. And why don't they leave? Something we don't know. Um, is it something about you know, some aspect of the animals themselves that kept them from migrating. Um, Laziness. Yeah, lazy. Are they lazy? But I mean, <laughs> if a whole population of animals is, if laziness were a trait that were adaptive, if a whole population of animals were lazy, they would never start migrating, right? You sure. Know, you're yeah, never if the gonna, whole population was. Yeah, you're never going to get up and go. So in their model, they started looking at the whole like okay some animals a few animals are going to be leaders and maybe these leaders are more sensitive to the environmental cues and then there are the followers and maybe the followers are more sensitive to social cues so they look at the leaders and go oh, oh other individuals oh look those guys are taking off where are those guys going oh, maybe i'll follow them you know and they just kind of follow and so they, they worked their computer model out and let their animals, their digital animals, uh, perform a bunch of migrations. And they found uh, a whole bunch of patterns that correlated with what are, what, what's been observed in nature. So um, uh, swarms of bees that follow a couple of scouts that have gone out searching for a new location for a hive to the new hive location. Uh, and they, it raises the the question of um, whether or not those individuals that don't migrate, if they're just not getting the message from their leaders. Um, and the, they said it was possible in the models for migration to evolve when individuals were widely scattered, which fits with the existence of migration in such insects as dragonflies and monarch butterflies that live independently and it's those in those animals that live independently maybe more individuals in the population are more sensitive to environmental cues than say social cues that would kind of make more sense um so it just kind of opens up a whole whole idea of how migration may have come to pass and in the last sentence of, of brandon's article he says evolution or um migration may vanish at a scale measured in human years. So it could be possible for humans to, an, to have an effect on migration or climate change to have an effect on migration and cause it to disappear really quickly. Um, but it could be recovered at time scales measured in planetary cycles. So it much take, must take a much, much longer time for it to come back at all. So an example he gives is bison in North America no, no longer seem to be able to migrate, but maybe at some point, you know, hundreds of years down the line, they might do so again if they survive. Kind of interesting. Where do they come from? How do they move? Um, and then moving from how does migration happen to just how does evolution happen? There's this other story that was sent in like last week by Ed Dyer. And then this week, uh, sent it again by Melissa Ayers. So I thought I had to get it in for sure. Um, evolution was caught in the act in some Australian lizards. It's a species of lizard that lives along the low lands of New South Wales. And it also, the same species uh, range extends up into the mountains. So it goes from the lowlands to the mountains. The lowlands are really warm and the mountains can be really cold. They found that the one the the group at the low in the lowlands lays eggs. 
the group in the mountains has live young. It mm. doesn't lay eggs. And in between, there is a group that sometimes does either. Sometimes mm. it lays eggs and sometimes it has live young, depending, and it all seems to depend on the temperature. Because it's a lot harder when it's cold outside to keep an egg warm. So there's this question of, you know, they think that they've caught evolution actually taking place and that based on where these different lizards exist, that this single species is in the process of turning into multiple species. That's super cool. I want to go back for a second to the uh, migration thing. Okay. Uh, th there's something that's uh, pretty stunning about that. If you look at a lot of the, the bird migration patterns, um, they, there are different routes that birds will take uh, as, as the groups leave. Some will sort of take a, uh, there's, I can't remember which, what, it was, what it was, but it's something that the nests down in like New Zealand and makes its way up to Canada. And it, some of them come along the western uh, seaboard of the United States and some have this sort of other island hopping route that they take that's mostly over sea. But they all end up at the same destination. Um, so obviously there's going to be different landmarks. There's going to be uh, different environmental factors. It's going to be different leaders maybe. And then, but over time, I guess they sort of learn these different routes. But there's two really distinct routes that the birds take to go um, and to get to their destination. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, if in a lot of these, uh, because they're usually heading to a place that is a good breeding ground, or they're showing up somewhere right before a food source is going to be available, or the place that they're leaving becomes in, inhospitable before they've left there. I'd be really fascinated uh, with them finding out yeah, finding out how that evolved or what, what the difference is that, uh, that have evolved. Because I have a feeling that would be a form of epigenetics or of a, almost a Lamarckian thing where, or a genetic memory, a way mm -hmm. that experience on the planet over many, many, many generations has sort of left a marker for the future generations to get to a better location to survive in. Yeah. Huh. It's a, you know, speculatory kind of a thing, but yeah. how else does something like that evolve over a species that... May, I mean, it seems to have such a great benefit to them. It's definitely been a tradition that's gone on year after year after year after year. And so what came first? Was it just that they were attracted to some sort of magnetic field that they were aware of? Uh, or they were, you know, at a certain time their home rooms were different, so the climate was, was, wasn't was comfortable? Or was it that somehow their bodies had devised a way of training uh, and implanting in the future generations a, uh, a tactic or a maneuver or that yeah. In, in this. Yeah, that's really interesting. There's um, there was a, there was a study that I think it was in June or July. June it was published. Um, Ed Dyer sent it to me um, that suggests that viruses are also important in speciation and these kinds of changes. Adapt adaptive changes that take place, um, that there's a, a group of, of what are called transposons in our genome where they're otherwise known as jumping genes, that they can actually move from place to place within our genome. And so I mean, it's not during our lifetime that they move place to place, but during uh, reproduction. So when there's crossover and there's, mo and, and there's uh, replication of the genes, they actually start moving around. And they found several of these gene sequences that they think are viral remnants from you know, millions of years ago that contain instructions or code that, um, that uh, transcription instructions. So little instructions will come and attached to it and actually start genetic processes of, you know, creating proteins or, or stop genetic processes or, you know, any number of things. And so when the jumping genes move from place to place to place, they can have all sorts of unknown effects because of all these instructions that they somehow, that they contain in them and that can be moved. So it just, they move and suddenly there's a gene that's turned off. And what if that gene is the gene or a gene that's turned on and maybe 
some suddenly they're in a location it's in a location to go oh now you can sense magnetic fields <laughs> i don't know that would be so, awesome yeah so there's some really interesting stuff that suggests that all animals humans included really might have been you know formed by viruses yeah well why not yeah i wish we still had that ability though to be you know sort of I mean, some of it, there'd be a lot of failure involved, obviously. <laughs> Just wake up, wake up one, one night in the middle of the night and realize you have night vision. Like, oh, right on. I could use this. That would be cool. That would be cool. We For that, we're going to have to wait for like gene therapy, RNA interference to like, you know, those kinds of technology. techniques. We yeah. don't need to evolve anymore. We can actually de-evolve a little bit. <laughs> We've got technology. We can actually see at night. No, with our technology. We don't need anything else. Oh, yeah, night vision technology. Mm. We have night, and we have, you know, electricity, yeah. light bulbs. <laughs> but yeah, we also have that where it's a, it can actually be dark everywhere, but we're, we of have course. the infrared using a different <laughs> light source. But <laughs> That's so funny. I'm like, yeah, night vision. You're like, yeah, light bulbs. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so the human quest for longer life Maybe one step closer. Yes. Yes. Thanks to a research team from uh, Concordia University. This is uh, published in the journal Aging. New study is the first to identify the role of a certain type of acid called lithiocolic acid, LCA, in extending the lifespan of normally aging yeast. The findings may have significant implications for human longevity and health, as yeast share, uh, share some common elements with people. We're like really closely related to them in some ways. Uh, although we found that LCA greatly extends yeast longevity, yeast does not synthesize this or any other type of uh, this type of acid found in mammals. So the acid that they're talking about, this acid that they're finding can extend longevity, is bile. Bile? Really? Yeah. Bile acid extends longevity. So, yeah. So Maybe I should that... save it the next time I get really violently I ill? I don't know. I don't this... know. What's, the... <laughs> What's the story? Okay. All right, kids, take your vitamins. Ugh. Drink your milk, eat your vegetables, and... Uh... Drink your bile. Oh, yeah. Yeah, drink your bile. <laughs> Ew. We'll pack a little bile there in your uh, lunchbox. Uh, I don't want you pouring it out, you know. <laughs> Oh, really? So it may be that uh, yeast have evolved to sense bile acids as mildly toxic molecules and respond by undergoing life-extending changes. That's one of the uh, the speculations out there right now. It is also conceivable that the life-extending potential of LCA may be relevant to humans as well. Hmm. <laughs> well, of course, what's good for yeast is good for humans, right? I mean, so, I mean everything. Like, oh, we figured this out in yeast. Yeah, applicable to humans. And uh, while this uh, particular line wasn't actually written in a uh, in a grant proposal, it does uh, sound like one. This leads us to believe that bile acids have potential as pharmaceutical agents for the treatment of diabetes, obesity, and various metabolic disorders, all of which are age-related. They may indeed op offer hope for a healthier aging life. Says, uh, yeah. Researchers involved. That's amazing. Bile. Hmm. It's good that we're looking everywhere, though, because, you know, what if that's, you know, <laughs> what if it's fly vomit? Yeah. I mean, fly vomit turns out to be the thing that makes it so people can live to be a thousand years old. You. Hopefully, you it, hopefully it's nothing like, but it'll all be in pill form. You know, just swallow your pill. Be happy. It's all, you know, don't worry. You're not going to have to, like, drink a cup of bile or fly vomit. <laughs> that's not gonna. That's not gonna be the story. <laughs> but you brought up this story, so you're you're forcing me to jump ahead to a story that is very similar. Um, that was that was sent in on uh, telomeres and telomere activating compounds. This was sent in by Jeffrey Johnson, and I think it's fascinating. These researchers. This is a. I think, you know, all with a, grace, a grain of salt, um, as this is, a, uh, there's some academics, but it's also some private corporations who are working on this. However, 
This story published in uh, Gizmag, written up in Gizmag, the artic- original scientific article was published in Rejuvenation Research, which is a bi-monthly journal that I couldn't... Um, Oh, it does have an open access option. I just didn't even get that. So I wasn't able to read the story in the article, in the, in the journal just yet. But from this Gizmag article, it's really interesting. Supposedly, this group of researchers collaborating between TA Sciences, JARE Incorporation, Sierra Sciences, PhysioAge, and the Spanish National Cancer Research Center have discovered a compound called TA65. They call it a nutraceutical. So it comes from a natural compound that, uh, so it's derived from a natural compound that they uh, have isolated it from um, and that you could potentially take it. And they say all experiments suggest that it activates telomerase. Telomerase is the enzyme that helps to protect and rebuild your telomeres. And one of the hypotheses about aging is that your telomeres, like every time you get sick, um, anything affecting your body is going to chop away at your telomeres. And when you have no more telomeres, which are the caps at the ends of your chromosomes, when they get chopped all up, you're dead. That's it. You're aging. You're dead. So if we could find a way to stop or even repair telomere damage, we could potentially halt aging if this hypothesis is correct. And this is the first compound that they say is safe for humans and that their tests show that um, individuals infected with cytomegalovirus, which they say prematurely ages the immune system uh, by decreasing the telomeres, they say that TA65 caused an apparent age reversal based on one biomarker of immune aging. So they were looking at a biomarker, um, you know, probably some enzyme or or something, uh, a hormone or something, uh, to see whether or not uh, that, uh, that changed and it probably was reduced or increased depending on whatever that biomarker uh, was. But it, this is potentially significant along with yours also. I mean, the fact that we're, you're, the, the story you came up with, Justin, like the fact that we're looking at these compounds that scientists, companies are isolating, are saying, hey, drink this, take this pill, we'll stop your aging. And suddenly everybody's <clears throat> living to 125 instead of 65. Right, which means we're going to have to take uh, every sort of ban on harmful uh, behavior, uh, dangerous behaviors. We're going to have to get rid of airbags in cars. (laughs) We're going to have to, you know, let kids start smoking at like age four. We're, because we don't, we're gonna take if we take the lid off of dying, then the whole planet's gonna implode. So you gotta yeah, have you population's have, gonna. You have to you add some stochasticity back into the model. Exactly. That's take right. the pads off the uh, and helmets off the football players. <laughs> um, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. If you make it, you can have the pill and live forever. But you gotta survive first. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That would be pretty, I mean, the the idea that if you have a, um, you know, a, an immune disorder that ages you and that you could take a pill and be back to your chronological age, you know, that, you know, it's kind of cool. It's kind of a neat idea, but the population issues, that's going to be the one that we're going to have to deal with. Population and even more so than population energy. It's, uh, yeah. it just, it, it is a... Although the population density one, I, there was a, oh, I think it's, I think it might have even been Asimov, who who had the analogy. Uh, somebody's got to go Google this and find out who it is, so I'm not giving it to the wrong person. But I think it was Asimov, talking about population, uh, uh, the population growth and the and the density and what would come of it. And he, he used this analogy of a bathroom. If two people live in a house with two bathrooms. Whenever anybody wants to use the bathroom, they can use the bathroom. They can use the bathroom. They can stay in there as long as they want to do whatever it is they need to do in there. And no problem. You know, 
If there's a third person, chances are they're gonna they're gonna work it out. If there's four people, same thing. If there's eight people, it starts to become difficult. And if there's twenty people living in this house with two bathrooms, there is no longer the dignity and and freedom that was once enjoyed of the bathroom where you could go in, use it when you want, have it as long as you want, and enjoy it. The bathroom. Now there's somebody banging on the door. You're expected to hurry up. Like, what are you doing in there? Like, get it over. Come on, guys. People, there's a line. It's always. It's a stressful thing. So the freedom, the dignity, and the sort of uh, relaxed state that we used to, uh, we're used to being, and we consider our civilization, would be much, much different with uh, with more population. Oh yeah, yeah, much, much different. I don't know. I don't know. I love the idea of you know being everyone. I mean, to live longer is, but there are just so many problems that come along with it. But you know, we'll, we'll work it out. We'll figure it out. I hear, unless, I, hear unless, I hear that by May of next year, if we keep uh, discovering planets at the same rate, we'll discover a habitable, habitable Earth-like planet. Yeah, but we won't be so, able to get there. The real solution yeah. is we can live forever, forever even. We can continue yeah. to grow the population. All we need to do is make the engineer the future generations of humans to be more, no more than three feet tall. <laughs> That's right. We, We'll Many just shrink, people. just shrink the population, and then every everybody's house could be <laughs> retrofitted to be a uh, you know with another story. It's for perfect. Every floor. We're, we're already shrinking. We're already starting to 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 grow mini cows and mini sheep and and little mini animals for you know ranching on smaller amounts of land, taking up less food resources. So this is perfect. Huh? Smaller animals, smaller people. Everything's One square good. acre of uh, of uh, farming now feeds twice as many people. <laughs> Is it twice as much food? No, it's half as much people. Half as many people. In fact, I think a three foot. If you shrink the person by half, they they lose much more than half the weight. <laughs> that, that, that actually, that it might be some sort of magnitude. Like maybe now that uh, what used to feed one person now feeds like thirty people. It could be huge. It could be totally huge. All right, let's jump into outer space because Woo-hoo. we're going to have to go there sometime soon. But isn't it always nice to find out things like where did our solar system come from? Did we were we birthed out of a type 1A or a type 2 supernova? I mean, don't these questions just haunt you? Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, I I lie awake at night. Well, a meteorite that crashed into France 100 years ago called the Arguelle meteorite um, is really old, over 4.5 billion years old. And it's got some little tiny uh, little pieces of evidence that, that may tell the story of where our solar sister system came from. So there are isotopes that are found that have been found in this meteor um, by analysis of um, such as chromium 54 and uh, an iron isotope. And what was the other one? I forget what the other one is. I can't find it. Oh, and aluminum. So aluminum 26 then iron and iron 60 to, they're little tiny, tiny nanoparticles. And the one thing that people are really looking at is the chromium 54. And so researchers publishing in the Astrophysical Journal this last week, uh, a paper called Neutron Rich Chromium Isotope Anomalies in Supernova Nanoparticles that are found in the meteor. Basically what they're suggesting is that because there are different chromium isotopes found in the meteor than say here on our own planet it gives evidence of the event that may have formed the solar system since the meteor was around kind of at the predating or before um, the birth of our solar system which is kind of cool so because it just happened to be in the neighborhood it got rained down on by a whole bunch of supernova particles as the um, giant star that was there went supernova. And so by looking at these anomalies in the chromium, they hope that they'll be able to determine at some point whether or not it was a type 1A or a type 2 supernova. But they definitely, they definitely know it was a supernova that formed our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
yes. We came from a supernova. It's kind of cool. Um, oh, and you know how um, amateur astronomers were the ones to see the uh, the meteor hit uh, Jupiter? Was it Jupiter? Yeah. Yeah, this uh, summer, right? Uh-huh. Um, well, this was sent in by Pamela, and the really interesting this this analysis of the images that the amateur astronomers uh, uh, had has actually been um, there's an analysis that's actually been done by professional astronomers, academic astronomers, um, and they they're like, oh yeah, you really did see something good. And basically, what this comes down to is. Uh, amateur astronomers might be really, really important for the future of observing these types of events in our solar system. Because amateur astronomers have uh, telescopes that are strong enough to take a look at places like Jupiter and Saturn, the, the gas giants in our solar system, but not, you know, way far out. And so while um, f astrophysicists and cosmologists are looking really far away, they're not really looking at the home turf. And so amateur astronomers are keeping an eye out and might actually be the, uh, the guard that sees a whole bunch of really interesting events that occur uh, in our own solar system. So go amateur astronomy, you have a big future. I think it's pretty awesome. And finally, my little la my last little space story that was sent in by Rapid Eye and Rapid Eye wanted you Justin to try and pronounce the name of the effect <laughs> just because he thought it would be funny to hear you try and pronounce it. Um, this um, the effect that that uh, Planck the Planck Space Observatory is uh, observing in its search for far-off galaxy clusters. So Planck has observed a bunch of galaxy clusters and has potentially, they think it has found a new supercluster that was not previously known hmm. by means of what is called the sunyeyev zeldovich effect. Oh, yes. well, it wouldn't be too tough. It wouldn't be too tough. You would have gotten it. <laughs> I think it would have been fine. <laughs> But uh, anyway, the interesting thing that they're trying to do with Planck and a couple of other um, Planck looks at the micro has has uh, has detectors that detect microwave frequencies of the sky, and so um, the the signature leaves uh, an imprint of this for this sunyeyev zeldovich effect, leaves an imprint on the cosmic microwave background. And so uh, with Planck looking at the microwave radiation and with uh, the ESA's XMM Newton that's looking in, in different energetic spectrum, they were actually able to find a really neat supercluster, which <laughs> is a supercluster is basically a bunch of galaxy clusters that are close together. And what they're hoping to do with these uh, these observatories is really get a good idea of the, the filaments that hold the universal matter together. So to find out, you know, where energy ebbs and flows and kind of, I don't know, I, when, I, when I look at pictures uh, that they when they show pictures of the large scale structure in the universe, like to me, it looks like um, tissue under that I, I would look at under a microscope, like with actual filaments. And it looks like there's, I mean, it really looks like it's something biologically organic, but it's, it's not. So the way that the, the energy uh, is just really interesting. It's really fantastic, uh, fascinating the way that it's structured. And so they're just trying to get an idea of how cosmic structures formed and evolved. Yeah, it, it looks like you're in, in within the uh, inside of a giant sponge or right. uh, maybe even like a sponge that hasn't been cleaned and has stuff growing in it. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of, it's very strange looking. Bunch of dusty looking spider webs out there. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's like kind of like spider webs. Yeah, exactly. So, so 
Plank is, um, you know, taking some really great pictures and getting some some really interesting discoveries. So it's neat new super cluster that they hadn't seen before using other de- other detection devices. So yay! So how does a Sunday yay Zelda the the uh, How does it how does it uh, get the imprint though? That's a really strange thing. It right. says it's a character signature they imprint on the cosmic microwave background. It's just. Mm, scientists are getting more scientists um so what occurs let me let me tell you from a quote from this article um nabila aganim of the institut d'astrophysique spatiale in orsay france my pronunciation was awful but anyway nabila says as the fossil photons from the big bang cross the universe They interact with the matter that they encounter. When traveling through a galaxy cluster, for example, the cosmic microwave background photons scatter off of free electrons present in the hot gas that fills the cluster. These collisions redistribute the frequencies of photons in a particular way that enables us to isolate the intervening cluster from the cosmic background signal. Hmm. And so that's the effect that they're using, the Sunyeyev Zeldovich effect. So in effect, the because the electrons in the hot gas in these galaxy clusters is the electrons that are much higher energy than the photons. When the photons hit the electrons, the electrons transfer some of their energy and they actually usually shift the photons up in energy. So there's m- much fewer, there's like a bias towards the high energy end of the spectrum. And so they know that's how they know that they're looking at a cluster. Hmm. Yeah. That is that is super cool. Yeah, I think it is pretty cool. I think it's really neat. And it, the article that that, that the uh, European Space Agency has put out, there's some really beautiful pictures that uh, show this energy shift. And it, it's, it's really neat. I like it. It's space. It's physics. What? Yes, it is physics. It's physics. It is. Physics in space. There you go. There you go. That's my so I've, got, I've got bad news to anybody who's uh, habitually living their keys, losing their keys. But do, I, do we have time to get to it? Should I get to this or should I wait till the uh, second half? Yeah, should we take a break? Let's go to the break. Let's go to the bridge. Take it to There's the There's an place. engineer somewhere who's desperately wanting to push a button. That, that, that there is. You're absolutely right. So, take it to the break. (laughs) The first thing to expect us When Homo turns erect us Would be the use of tools And next comes prejudice And the next thing I think we'll see With increased mental capacity Would be the use of laws and decrees designed To take freedoms away from you and me We got a world to kill We got a mind to fill Where there's will I guess there's way There's not much else to say. And I would just like to remind everybody that if they are interested in getting a free, free audiobook download, they can head on over to audiblepodcast.com forward slash twists audiblepodcast.com forward slash twists um, is where you can sign up for a an audible account and download a free audiobook if you are so inclined uh, the twist book club has lots of books the backlog of books that we've read over the past months there are many of them within the audible library and I yeah, highly highly suggest that you check it out try and get into the um 
get into the audio, dig into the Audible library. I'm sure you'll find something that you enjoy. I've found many books there myself, all the way from fiction to nonfiction, many science books, periodicals, even some podcasts in there as well. Um, but Audible really has the largest selection of audiobooks for you to download available online. And then the great thing about an audiobook is that you're not stuck in one place. You can take it with you and go. Put it in any device. Head on out. You know, listen to a book. Doing whatever it is that you're doing on your mobile time. So once again, audiblepodcast.com forward slash twist for your free audiobook download. Do it now. And uh, just a reminder, also, we need a show notes volunteer. So email me at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com if you're interested in doing show notes for us. We'd love your help. Please. The population just happens to be the last thing I think we need. See, science is a double-edged blade at best. Oh, I embrace it not one to protest when a computer beats a master at chess i guess you'd better wonder what comes next oh we got a world to kill we got a mind to fill where there's will i guess there's way there's not much else to <laughs> Are we back? We're back. 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 For this time. <laughs> I was just waiting for you to stop typing. <laughs> I'm just waiting for you. I don't know what you're doing over there. That's, is that me? Yeah. I'm just hanging out in the. Uh, this is. We got a good. There's like a whole show going on in the forum. <laughs> That's right. That is right. But we're back. This is This Week in Science, where we're going to finish out this hour with some top notch science. Woo! Super fun stuff. What was the story that you were going to uh, tell us for those of us who forget our keys uh, all the time? Not uh, that I, don't I remember. am in among. I'm, I'm not. A, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't remember <laughs> what the story was. Oh, here it is. Here's a piece of paper. I'll just read what's on it and maybe. Uh, It'll uh, come study to at, you. Study at Rush <laughs> University Medical Center has linked the earliest stages of cognitive decline Yikes. to lesions. In the brain, which, yes, so large groups of French soldiers in your brain <laughs> is linked somehow to the earliest stage of cognitive decline. Simply getting older is not the cause of mild memory lapses, often called senior moments. According to a new study by researchers at Rush Alzheimer's Disease Center, the study published September 15, uh, 2010, online issue of Neurology. What they found is that even the very early mild changes to memory that are common as, as we age are uh, more signs of uh, signs of dementia and uh, could be caused by brain lesions associated with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, just that they haven't hit in full force. There's nothing, there's nothing out. There's this, it's not that you just forget forgetful and the brain gets lazy. There's an actual physical lesion that is probably associated with why you don't have name recognition for your your grandchildren anymore. Maybe the, the brain cell associated with your grandchild's name died. It's kind of it's like, like eh. picture like uh, the brain as like vinyl, like an old record. There's a big scratch okay? in it. It's just it's just got a few uh, over the years, you know, things have been worn down. Some of the grooves aren't, uh, aren't as groovy as they used to be. <laughs> Very early mild cognitive changes that that once thought to be normal aging are really the first signs of progressive dementia, in particular Alzheimer's disease, says Robert S. Wilson, PhD at uh, Rush University. The pathology in the brain related to Alzheimer's and the other dementias has been has a or has a much greater impact on memory function in old age than we previously thought. So take heed, <laughs> take some heed if you are starting to forget those little things. Just because you're a little bit older doesn't mean 
it's normal. <laughs> it's it's something. Of course, there's nothing to say that there's a treatment for it. So it's one of those stories. I don't like those stories. Oh, but there is. But it's not a treatment. For treatment. brain lesions? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was um, um, vit- vitamin B12. Is, That's the one that gives you cancer. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, so, you know, so it's like, Here's the thing. what are you going to do? Here's the thing. Vitamin B12 reduces the the formation of lesions. So if uh-huh. you're, as your brain is kind of shrinking and things are dying, you supplement with vitamin B12 and that process slows down. And so, um, so you could possibly get cancer. But maybe not. It's not. It's B12 in that bacteria in your stomach that's the cancer thing and it's yeah that's fed by vitamin b well you can't yeah. just you just can't do anything you have to avoid the world right i think is what it well, or you can maybe vitamin figure out a way to ship. Might make that that whole lesioning thing you'll know, slow down and become less which is cool that's cool you'll be able to remember everything and they say that there are the people that people who had uh who took vitamin b12 who had less lesioning in the brain had better cognitive performance Oh, actually, and you know, uh, it actually gives you really cool dreams. Oh, maybe it was B six. Somebody is asking if it was B six. Am I wrong? Did I get it wrong? B twelve, I think, is the one that does the really good dreams. <laughs> maybe it was B six. Uh, I'm gonna have to check on that. But anyway, re- regardless, it's a B vitamin that's supposed to and you know, look things up. People, you look things up. Don't just take it on face value. <laughs> like we said, disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. <laughs> yeah, don't listen to us. What are you doing? Thank you. Exactly, exactly. Um, what else is happening? Oh, this week in being human. Or do you want to hear about this week in birds? Yeah, let's go. Let's do both. I want to hear about being human. You want to hear about being human? Okay. So, in being human, well, it's how far away from human are we going to get? And this is this is where I'm getting with the uh, the being human kind of aspect of the title of this section. Um, Ed Dyer sent in a story about researchers creating artificial ovaries that can develop um, oocytes, which are egg cells that can mature into human eggs. Um, they basically set up a scaffolding and seeded it with. Uh, a particular type of of cell tissue um, that that is baked. It's the, uh, the let's see what kind of cells were they? I'm trying to f- granulosa cells. So granulosa cells make up the majority of the tissue, the supportive tissue of the ovary. So they made up this honeycomb structured scaffolding, seeded it with granulosa cells, and then they took donated egg cells and theca cells. Basically, everything was donated. Um, and they got they got these theca cells, granulosa cells, and uh, egg cells. Everything donated. And were able to get the whole thing to grow. So the basically, the structure grew, and it supported the egg cells. And those egg cells, those little oocytes, were able to mature into human eggs. And if they're able to mature into human eggs, that means that the ovary could probably release an egg and then it could become fertilized. So this this creation, an artificial ovary, I mean, could you imagine for people who, women who go through cancer treatment and lose their ovaries, what that could mean? I mean, if you if you have the tissue taken from you, before your cancer treatment and saved. And then after the cancer treatment, you mm. can have basically your own ovary put back in you or even a donor ovary. And it could allow you to naturally have children. I mean, if it's a donor ovary, of course, it's not going to be um, genetically your child. But at the same time, it would allow you to have a child. Yeah, but you still have to be pregnant and go through the whole birthing thing. See, the the real advance is to make it so that the woman doesn't have to do any of that. (laughs) We just do it in the lab. You come back, okay, you've ordered a child. uh, Come back in 40 weeks, 
and uh, we'll have your uh, we'll have your child ready for you. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I keep asking. I'm like, can't we just do this in a petri dish yet? I mean, I would love <laughs> to. I mean, I'm I'm starting to starting to feel the little nano kicking in here. There's like, mm. there's little, there's feel, I feel things and it's really weird, but I mean, it would be really cool to have it in like a fishbowl and like just be able you to go, could see it, yeah. you are, you are just like, <laughs> do, 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 do. And carry my, carry my little baby fishbowl around with me everywhere. You'd get rid of the cats though, wouldn't you? Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, somebody in the chat room was asking, what's the point of a donor ovary versus insemination? And I think the whole process, like if you could just surgically... But once get an ovary transplanted into you, you know, if you've lost, if, you know, for whatever reason you've lost your ovary, you have everything else and you can get an ovary transplanted into you that works, you can go about everything else naturally as opposed to insemination, which are all these doctor visits and hormones and, you know, all these crazy things. I mean, it would just be so much better, but um, yeah, it's just a little crazy. It would be a little, you know. The whole the whole thing it, you take it to an extreme and it can be a little bit a little bit crazy, so you know how how human can we get? Um, now there's a story that, another story sent in by it, Ed Dyer. It would be, well, hey, it would be different. I mean, we'd be yeah. different if, if if you talked to human beings on planet Earth 200 years ago and described all the changes that were going to be happening today. We were we're not humans compared to what they were, and mm -hmm. you know, but we're still here and we're still very human, right? But, you know, I mean, it would seem like it would be just so, things would be so different. No, all of our civilization, but now we're just people. <laughs> or we look like people. Maybe we're not like people anymore. Maybe we're not humans. Not the humans of 200 years ago. Certainly not the, the right. humans of 1,000 years ago. They weren't even potty trained. How is that even being a human? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I don't know. Any, any one of these that says it would change things too much uh, forgets how much we've changed, I think. Right, right. Um, there's another study that was sent in by Ed Dyer that I thought was really interesting, um, that male maturity, and I don't know what this means, whether this is like psychological maturity, but it's mostly, um, physiological maturity is shaped by, um, how much food they get during their first six months of life. Um, some researchers uh, based out of Northwestern University, but doing research in the Philippines, uh, looked at 770 Filipino males aged 20 to 22 who have been part of a research study and been followed for their entire lives. So this is a very long-term research study. Um, so they looked at what kind of food they got, how much, you know, how fat they were as babies uh, for the first six months and then now at the age of 20 to 22 how do how how do they look what what what's the what are the aspects of their sexual maturity uh, that that they could that they could look at they found that on average men who had better nutrition during those first 6 months of life tended to be taller and more muscular than females and the magnitude of that difference was based on the first six months of the male's life. It's crazy. They additionally found those males, um, they uh, were stronger. They had high, higher testosterone levels as young adults than other males. Um, they also had sex for the first time at a younger age and were more likely to report having had sex in the past month, resulting in more lifetime sex partners. This is all based on nutrition during the first six months wow i mean it's also you know maybe hard to say okay it's the first six months what is is that indicative of the families the environmental condition you know what kind of an environment they grow up in for their whole lives you know are the first six months indicative of the uh, the conditions that they're going to have to be in for their whole life or is it really probably a good survey six months <laughs> yeah but it's really funny. I'm like, all right, first six months, fatten them up. <laughs> go, go be. Is live, that, you're not drinking live, coffee, are live you? Live long and prosper. What are you know? drinking there? Water. Okay, just check. Water, it looks like you're blowing on water, your water. water. Cool it down. No. Better not be coffee. I don't drink coffee anymore. 
Really? No, I don't drink coffee anymore. That's amazing. I know. I used to. I don't have think coffee. I've ever seen. Well, of course, I also mostly see you at like over the last five years at seven thirty in the morning. <laughs> I know. I don't drink coffee so, at seven thirty in the morning like, either. You know, I just had coffee. I mean, if you didn't, then it was going to be a rough show. <laughs> uh, hey, um, there's been another study whether or not uh, to see whether or not uh, a company's CEO holds a college degree from a top school, <clears throat> like one of those Ivy Leaguer type, really expensive, uh, handed down from generation to generation type uh, old money schools, or uh, one of the cheaper, you know, cheaper average, every everyday average person could probably go to the university type thing. Turns out there's really not a whole lot of difference in the overall performance of companies that are <laughs> CEO'd by the the most expensive CIA, CEOs with the most, uh, uh, what, what would you say, um, most expensive colleges, I guess, or the most prominent college backgrounds. The survey, they went through and looked at a whole bunch of whole bunch of different companies and, and compared their performance to others and did so based on the degrees of the CEOs and where they got them. And they found that it was eh, pretty much flatline. Doesn't matter where you go to school uh, in business for business. <laughs> the applications of your business education will will work just as well anywhere you go. Hmm. That's funny. But don't you think that depending on where you where you go, you're going. It's not necessary. So you're probably going to l learn basically. So you're going to learn basically the same stuff. That or uh, CEOs don't actually do anything. <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's the other thing. That's the other possibility. That's another, like, that is another possibility. Figurehead. Like, uh, I'm going to go golf with a couple of the CEOs and other companies. They're talking about merger and acquisition stuff. It's going to be a long day. Long yeah. day. Long. long uh, day. I don't know. Uh, yes, yeah, so the suggestion, uh, the findings suggest that both boards and researchers should use caution in placing too much emphasis on uh, an individual's education when trying to assess their ability to lead a company and maximize mm -hmm. shareholder business uh, value. I mean, obviously, there are things in which education is is direly important. Um, maybe business isn't one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, maybe there's a certain point where it's experience also. So the education isn't so much. Maybe it's experience. Maybe it's who you know. It's... Um, maybe just leadership ability. You know, some people are just good at being leaders, mm -hmm. making decisions and sounding decisive. You know, and those things don't, you don't necessarily learn in school. Those aren't necessarily things at all. So, you know, yeah. Yeah, that comes with entitlement of, of being, coming from a very wealthy family. Yeah. <laughs> I think right. that's... Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Oh, in birds, story sent in by Pamela, um, bird news, there's some bower birds. I think they're called the great bower birds. Where did my story go? Oh, I think I might have closed the window. Whoops. Oh, well. Um, so anyway, these bower birds, normally bower birds, blue bower birds collect things that are blue and make nice blue structures during the mating season to woo their um, their uh, partners, prospective partners. This, this particular, that this study uh, dealt with, uh, this particular species of bower birds um, is more, is a whitish color bird and they actually collect white and gray color stones to create um, a stage area and an approach. So kind of like an aisle and then a stage. And it turns out that the female ends up coming and hanging out in the approach, the aisle area, looking at the stage where the, ma where the male hangs out. And the males use a trick of uh, geometry to make the stage appear smaller from the perspective of the female so that the male himself appears larger. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so they set up all these stones and um, just set, set this whole thing up to make themselves look good. So it's, the idea would be like, <laughs> wait a sec, 
So, like, you come over to the house, and it's, like, all small furniture. Right. Like, all undersized furniture. Look see, how like, large I low. am. Exactly. <laughs> the ceiling, uh, it's about six-foot ceilings. Mm-hmm. <laughs> undersized. Exactly. Yeah, undersized exactly. everything else in the room. That's yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, this deception, the deceiving their prospective lovers by making their bower look bigger, um, Pamela wrote, they're the only non-human species thus far that we know of that does this sort of thing for mating purposes, according to this study, which I find really interesting. The de- this deception of, hey, don't I look good? You know, it's like, women wearing in this this case it's the male doing stuff but in the case of you know like females it's like push-up bras and lipstick and that kind of thing um to make yourself look bigger look better it's fascinating oh birds birds we love you we learn so much about ourselves from the bird world time for the minion mailbag that's right. We got some mail. This time it's from Angela Heinz Kudzia. Did Angela hey, get Angela. married? She has a different last name. What's going on yeah. there? Did she get married? Marriage has been taking place in the world. People oh. are hooking up out there. Well, congratulations, Angela, if, if that's what happened. Congratulations. Anyway, she writes, The discussion on education and genes and changing a system versus taking a pill reminds me very much of my job. I work in a psychiatric facility and find that the system created for mental illness is not a therapeutic atmosphere so much as a pill-pushing experiment. We see people walk through our hospital who are slapped with a diagnosis for the purpose of getting funds from insurance, then medicated as if their lives depended on it. It takes away the drive of the individual to live a healthy, well-balanced life because they believe they are doomed to be off balance without these pills. Many become frequent flyers of psych hospitals. There's cer- there are certainly conditions in which individuals require medications and more intense treatments. However, many are being treated for simply being human and having variations in the way we live, cope, similar to Justin's ADHD in kindergarten story. We should be offering education on stress management, healthy living, or how to identify what type of person we are, a personality type, learning type, etc., and using that information to benefit us. But as, as you stated, it's just easier to pass the pills. I say put those prescription pads away and let's just allow ourselves to be human. I think that was really well stated. Thanks, Angela. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Round of applause. And uh, I guess that's it. With no further comments, it's on to next week. Moving forward into the scientific future. That's what we do, right? Sometimes. <laughs> that's right. I want to give a quick shout out to Mike A. Thanks for finding and listening to Twist. Do appreciate it. Sorry we didn't get your story in this week. But thanks so much. Glad that you're uh, digging into the archives. They do go back a little ways. So we hope we keep you busy for a little while. And uh, if you uh, liked anything you heard, I don't have the thing up. Which, oh. What do we say at the end of the show? <laughs> do you want me to just read the whole thing? Yeah, read should the whole I, thing. I forget I just read what the, it all says. Should I just read the whole thing? I'll give you a Something if there's like websites in there. <laughs> oh, man. It's because you're all you're, you're busy IRCing. No, there's a cheat sheet, but you, I got booted <laughs> out of the, uh, for some reason. Oh, wait, wait. I bet if I hit this button, hit it'll button. work again. Hit the button. You can do it. <laughs> No, interwebs fail. I got booted out of your, um, the thing where it normally is. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening to Twists. We hope you enjoyed the show. We're available as a podcast. Not just live, not just on the radio. Just search for This Week in Science in iTunes. Uh, or if you have an Android device, you can look for Twists for Droid. That's Twist T-W-I-S, number four, Droid app in the Android marketplace. For more information on anything that you've heard here today, show notes, probably, well, at least for the most yeah, most part, we'll get the show notes up. They'll be on our website, www.twis.org. If you want to help us write show notes, you can let me know by emailing me because we like hearing from you. So email me at Kirsten, K-I-R-S-T-E-N at thisweekinscience.com. You can also email Justin, but he doesn't get his email yet because I am slow and 
Email Kirsten, Kirsten with the emails yeah. that you would email to me and then have him forward <laughs> it to my other emails. Yeah, then I'll forward them. All right. So you so can also write it down and send it carrier pigeon. Right. We, you can also contact us on Twitter at Dr. Kiki or at Jackson Fly. We do love your feedback. So if there's a topic or a suggestion for an interview or whatever you want us to cover, let us know. Feedback, too. We love your feedback. Like Angela's and letter stock here. Tips. Right. And we're going to be back here next week. It feels week. on wholesale clothing. <laughs> next week, same time, same place. We hope that you will join us again for more great sciencey goodness. And if you have learned anything from today's show, remember... And that does a little dance party ends another good show. Yay! Justin left. Okay, so post show is just going to be me talking to Justin's couch. <laughs> How is everybody in the chat room? Hope you enjoyed the show. This was a lot of fun.